This is Justice, History, and the Law. Lectures, discussions, and interviews from the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeff Follinsby, and I serve as the Chief Executive Officer of the Chautauqua Foundation and the Vice President for Development at Chautauqua Institution. I'm delighted to welcome all of you, and what a great crowd this afternoon, for this special presentation by Seth Waxman. Mr. Waxman's appearance is sponsored in part by the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, another significant educational organization here in Chautauqua County. It is a great pleasure to welcome Greg Peterson and members of the Jackson Center today and to introduce you to John Q. Barrett, who will then invite Mr. Waxman to the podium. John Barrett is a professor of law at, the, at St. John's University School of Law in New York City, where he teaches constitutional law, judicial biography, criminal procedure, and legal history. He is also the Elizabeth S. Linne Fellow at the Jackson Center. John is a graduate of Georgetown University and Harvard Law School and served as a law clerk to Judge A. Leon Higginbotham, Jr. of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit in Philadelphia. John also served as counselor to the U.S. Department of Justice Inspector General Michael Bromwich and as associate counsel in the Office of Independent Counsel Lawrence Walsh during the Iran-Contra proceedings. John's first exposure to Chautauqua occurred in our archives while researching material that would contribute to his critically acclaimed first book, That Man, an insider's portrait of Franklin D. Roosevelt, a previously unknown memoir of FDR by Robert Jackson. John has returned to Chautauqua many times on behalf of the Jackson Center and lectured in the amphitheater several years ago during a week on security and justice. We are always happy to have him here with us at Chautauqua. Please join me in a warm welcome for John Barrett. Thank you very much, Jeff. Good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you and Seth Waxman to this afternoon's third annual Robert H. Jackson Lecture at Chautauqua Institution. This lecture, this tradition and a collaborative endeavor that involves the Jackson Center, but is Chautauqua's, comes at a propitious time. For every July follows closely on the end of the Supreme Court's term and is a moment of Supreme Court recess and public scrutiny. And no better place embodies the habit of public scrutiny, serious thought, reflection, and discussion than Chautauqua Institution. It also is propitious and appropriate that this lecture goes forward under Justice Jackson's name, for he, of course, was from his boyhood through the rest of his life a son of Chautauqua County and a serious student of Chautauqua Institution, a speaker to be true for, from its platforms, but long before that, a serious attentive member of its audiences. Today's speaker, Seth P. Waxman, is a former Solicitor General of the United States. He is I'll have to ask him what his number is. I came up with number 40 or perhaps number 42, depending on how one counts and how much one cares about Jackie Robinson uh, in the string of solicitors general in our country. The solicitor general is often referred to as the 10th justice. The solicitor general is the one senior officer in the Department of Justice who by law is required to be learned in the law. And in our nation's history, up to the present and in our hopes for the future, the Solicitor Generalship embodies the best of the American legal profession. That's captured in the roster of some of the people who have held that office. William Howard Taft, John W. Davis, Archibald Cox, Erwin Griswold, Robert Bork, Kenneth Starr, Theodore Olson, and Seth Waxman. The tradition of a Jackson lecture here at Chautauqua focusing on legal aspects in the Supreme Court uh, is a three-year tradition. And Mr. Waxman today walks in illustrious footsteps of his predecessors. But I want to focus for a moment on some other predecessors, because those are the previous solicitors general who have preceded him as Chautauqua Institution speakers. 
The first I'll call to mind, and it's a lovely coincidence that I discovered, was literally 70 years ago today, when the sitting Solicitor General of the United States, Stanley Foreman Reed, spoke on the topic of the future of states in the federal system. Stanley Reed was Franklin Roosevelt's second Solicitor General, and not long after he spoke here on that July 9th, 1937, he was appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States, which created a vacancy, which led Roosevelt to appoint the second of the predecessors I'd like to call to mind, Robert H. Jackson, to be Solicitor General of the United States. In 1937, Jackson, an assistant attorney general, a Chautauqua County lawyer, was Stanley Reed's host when Solicitor General Reed was the speaker here at Chautauqua. He became his successor in that office. He later became his colleague on the Supreme Court. Ten years later, July of 1947, Justice Jackson was Chautauqua's speaker on the 4th of July on the weighty topic of American ideals and Nuremberg. The third predecessor I'll call to mind was not yet Solicitor General when he spoke here on August 6, 1957. He was instead Director Counsel of the NAACP, Thurgood Marshall. And Thurgood Marshall's topic here at Chautauqua just short of 50 years ago, was segregation, desegregation, and integration as of today. And oh, what a weighty title that would be to take on at this moment, but I digress. Thurgood Marshall, of course, went on to be appointed a Federal Circuit Judge and then Solicitor General of the United States by Lyndon Johnson and then a Justice of the Supreme Court. In those footsteps, a fourth SG former, future, etc. I'm being a little bit loose with the category. Uh, today stands Seth Waxman. You know, I think, from the Daily and from other reading, his distinguished biography. He's a graduate of Harvard College. He was a Rockefeller Fellow in Kenya, a graduate of Yale Law School, a law clerk to the Honorable Gerhard Gisell, one of the giants of the federal bench, an illustrious and successful private practitioner. And from November of 1997 until January of 2001, the Solicitor General of the United States, appointed by President Clinton. Seth Waxman today is a partner in the law firm of Wilmer Hale, and he is one of the nation's leading, most distinguished, most eloquent, and most successful Supreme Court advocates, which is what the Solicitor General does for the government, but what increasingly has become an elite, really high-quality specialist piece of the American bar on the private side of litigation. Again, I'll ask him what his count is. I get 49 or 50 as the number of Supreme Court cases that Seth Waxman has argued, including three in the just completed term of the court. Seth Waxman brings to this podium, to Chautauqua Institution, to the offices he, he has held, a distinguished ability, career trajectory, and as a personal point I may say with hope, a future in public service. But whether in government or out of government, he embodies the high ideals of Robert H. Jackson, of the Office of the Solicitor General of the United States, and frankly, of the American legal profession itself, which in its high forms, whether one is a government lawyer or a private practitioner, is public service. And so it's my great pleasure to welcome Seth Waxman, the Robert H. Jackson lecturer, who will address the topic of the evolving tentative role of United States courts in the, in the war on terror. Thank you. Well, I want to thank John for what I think is the most fulsome and frankly intimidating introduction I've ever had. Um, being told that I'm following in the footsteps of Stanley Reed 70 years ago to the day, Robert Jackson 60 years ago, and Thurgood Marshall 50 years ago was about to make me faint dead over. But I'll tr and then being told that I'm incredibly eloquent, et cetera, et cetera, is setting the bar pretty high. I hope I won't disappoint people. I can't tell you how thrilled Debbie and I have been to be here and to enjoy quote, everything Chautauqua has to offer, which is itself a pretty intimidating task. Um, when I grew up uh, in central Connecticut, um, we had a family tradition of sitting around the dinner table and arguing about things great and small. And whenever my father 
thought that it was time to, for the kids to clean up and everybody to go do their homework, he would say, ah, we're not gonna have a whole Chautauqua about this. <laughs> and I grew up thinking that Chautauqua was a noun. It was something that, you know, I didn't quite understand what it was, but it basically meant the discussion's over. Uh, that's what not having a Chautauqua was about, and it was only decades later that I actually realized that it was a proper noun, and it was a place of great historic importance and of sort of enduring intellectual and cultural significance, and yet years have passed with child rearing and professions, and we've never really had the opportunity or taken the opportunity to come here. Um, we were told that you know, we should by all means come a few days early and, and take advantage of everything that Chautauqua has to offer. The other thing we were told is that what Chautauqua offers includes the opportunity for relaxation, quiet contemplation, <laughs> sitting around on the porch doing not much of anything, and that duality has completely perplexed me because I feel that if we don't spend time sitting around thinking about our lives and the country and visiting with people here and enjoying the surroundings, we aren't really taking advantage of what Chautauqua really has to offer. On the other hand, I feel that if that is what we do, we clearly aren't taking advantage of everything that Chautauqua has to offer because there's always another lecture or a concert or a performance and in fact even trying to go to as many of them as we can, we regret all the ones that we've missed. So it's, it's really been a very, very great pleasure to be here. Um, and I will say that um, having experienced the incredibly welcoming, relaxed, sort of removed environment here, um, I have been a little, I have had a few second thoughts about the topic that I chose for today's lecture. This is um, sort of a depressing, complicated subject. Um, I, I got reconciled to continuing on my course um, uh, after listening to the the symphony's amazing concert on Saturday night in which Colin Carr was performing Shostakovich's second cello concerto. I'm sure most of you were here. Um, I love symphonic music. Um, I once contemplated a career in music performance and it's probably good for me and, my, and those who depend on me financially that I, that I chose not to pursue it. But, um, and I love listening to music in the summertime outdoors. The idea of listening to Shostakovich's second cello concerto, which was written at the very end of a long and difficult life in Stalinist Russia, is a challenge. It's, as don't have to tell those of you who were there, no, it is an unbelievably complicated, sad, difficult piece. And I looked around and I thought to myself, if this community can actually gather for and request an outdoor summer hearing of Shostakovich's second cello concerto, I can talk to them about the threat of terrorism. <laughs> I don't think that I'll be able to give the kind of performance that Colin Carr did, but I will give it my very best shot. I mean, Confronting the threat of terrorism, I don't have to tell anybody in our country, is among the paramount challenges of our generations. How do we protect the safety and well-being of our loved ones and our communities? How do we alter or refine our government institutions and processes so that they can meet this threat and yet still reflect the principles of transparency and accountability that are so essential to a representative democracy of limited government? How do we balance our primal need for security with our precious heritage of civil liberty and individual rights? It's easy to pose these questions. They are difficult, difficult questions to answer. They're not questions that we should allow others to answer for us. Sure, we look to our government leaders and institutions 
to devise and implement effective strategies for our well-being. But in our country, in a constitution that begins with the words, we the people, sovereignty rests with our citizens. It rests with all of us. It's our right to have our voices heard by those that we choose to enact and execute our laws. And it's our duty to wrestle with these problems in order to ensure that our nation survives and that it endures as the balanced, enlightened system that we cherish. I want to offer some observations this afternoon about the difficult choices that terrorism presents to one particular government institution, our courts. What role do and should courts play in what we've come to know as the global war on terror? Well, the Constitution provides little guidance. Under the Constitution, Congress's job is to enact laws, including the laws that empower the government to deal with terrorists. The President's job is to execute those laws, to lead us in war, and to represent our country in foreign affairs. What do courts do? Well, Article Three of the Constitution empowers courts to decide what are called cases and controversies. That is a completely reactive function. Congress proactively goes out and investigates and then decides what laws need passing and how much money we should allocate needs to be raised in order to put them into effect. The executive, the president, goes out and executes those laws that otherwise makes decisions on behalf of the country. But courts in our system have no mandate for proactivity. They're supposed to wait until a case is filed and then determine whether or not it presents the kind of dispute that is properly subject to judicial resolution. And if the answer is yes, they proceed to render judgment on the dispute between the specific parties. Well, how does that bear on the war on terror? Well, terrorism cases come to the courts in different ways. Victims of terrorism sometimes bring civil suits to recover money damages from the perpetrators or organizations that supported them. I'm going to put those kinds of cases to one side and focus on how courts get involved when our government confronts terrorism on behalf of all of us. The government may charge suspected terrorists with crimes. It may seek to deport suspected terrorists from our country, in which case deportees can challenge the government's action in court. Or as our recent history has illustrated, the United States military can seek simply to detain persons suspected of aiding terrorism, in which case those people who are detained may seek the review of our courts through a process known as habeas corpus. Now, generally speaking, when government power in our system is asserted against individuals, the paramount role of our courts is to ensure that the government stays within the bounds set by the Constitution and laws of the United States. Is the executive respecting the civil liberties that our Constitution enshrines? Is it acting within the authority granted by Congress, or if not, by the Constitution directly to the President? Now, because courts, as I said, are reactive institutions, not proactive, just how readily they can perform these two functions in terrorism cases depends in part on how the executive chooses to present those cases to the court or not. When the government chooses to prosecute suspected terrorists criminally, the courts do very well. And indeed, prior to 9-11, suspected terrorists in the United States were restrained and punished almost exclusively through criminal proceedings. We all know the name Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber. He was convicted in federal court of murder. The first bombing of the World Trade Center led to the conviction of Omar, Sheikh Omar 
Abdel Rahman and others for criminal conspiracy. Now, adjudicating crimes is a core judicial function. When we think of what our courts do, we think of a judge making rulings and conducting a criminal trial. And thus, if terrorism could be viewed purely as a criminal law problem, the role of the judiciary would be clear. Rules of evidence, individual rights, criminal procedure have been hammered out over generations to balance the rights of the accused to a fair trial with the rights of society to ensure that the guilty are punished. When courts enforce those rules, they don't need to call upon reserves of institutional credibility to legitimize what they're doing, to legitimate their authority. The political branches of government and all of us in the public are familiar with the role of courts in this regard, and we all honored the judicial actions that follow established law, even if in our opinion we might have ruled differently had we been the judge. And in these criminal cases, the role of the political branches is also clear. Congress writes the criminal law, and the executive prosecutes those who break it. And yet, when confronting terrorism, the stability of the criminal process comes with special limitations. Criminal laws and procedures may suffice to punish terrorists after the fact, but they might impede and at least they sometimes appear to impede, the important goals of preventing terrorist acts from occurring and relatedly from obtaining information from those who haven't yet committed a crime about, about terrorist acts that might occur. And much the same is true with when the government acts to deport an alien who is suspected of promoting terrorism. He or she is out of our country, but they aren't necessarily out of our hair. They probably aren't even detained anywhere. And so the alternative for government, of course, is to treat terrorism as a form of war. And here, at least, the appropriate role of the courts is, to say the very least, not well defined. Article 1 of the Constitution authorizes Congress to, quote, declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. The Constitution also empowers Congress to raise and support armies and to, quote, make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. Article 2 of the Constitution designates the President as, quote, the Commander-in-Chief of the Army and the Navy, and it also places in him the power to recognize and treat with foreign governments. About the judiciary in war, the Constitution says nothing. Now, as I indicated, courts have their historic functions to protect civil liberties, and to enforce the constitutional separation of powers, which is to say, to make sure that each branch of our government acts within and only within its own delegated of authority. But how, how and how well can courts perform these functions in terrorism cases where the executive chooses the war paradigm? Well, let's take the first uh, historic function, the protection of civil liberties. One might imagine that the judiciary's historic role to protect civil liberties would be heightened in times of war, if only because so often the political branches of our government are so willing to sacrifice individual liberties in favor of measures that are perceived as enhancing our national security. Our history has seen laws that punish our citizens who speak out against the war effort, that imprison those who by ethnicity or political affiliation are suspected as allies of the enemy, that hasten the punishment of enemy soldiers or even our own people when it is convenient for the war effort. This history led Francis Biddle who was Robert Jackson's successor as Solicitor General and Attorney General, 
to declare that, quote, the Constitution has never greatly bothered any wartime president. Now, in practice, American courts have protected wartime liberty, liberties on what I think could charitably best be described as an intermittent basis. When Congress and the president are aligned and appear to agree that a particular wartime measure is necessary, American courts, including our Supreme Court, have rarely stood in the way. Just consider the forced relocation of Fred Korematsu and other loyal Japanese Americans during World War II. As for the other function of courts, maintaining the separation of powers, courts sometimes do effectively mediate when one of the political branches, and it's usually the president, has apparently overstepped the bounds of its wartime authority. The classic case in our constitutional history is Youngstown Sheet and Tube versus Sawyer, in which the Supreme Court rejected President Truman's attempt during the Korean War to seize control over the nation's steel mills, which were threatened with a strike. And the court held that only Congress could authorize an emergency measure of this sort. Justice Jackson's concurring opinion in that case is the preeminent articulation of the president's wartime authority vis-a-vis -vis Congress. And it is an opinion that is very much on the minds of jurists and lawyers throughout the government today. Now, how does all of this relate to the peculiarities of the war on terror? A war without spatial or temporal bounds, a war in which our enemies wear no uniforms, and for the most part, fight for no organized state. Since 9-11, our government has sometimes invoked criminal laws, the criminal paradigm against suspected terrorists. You probably recall the name John Walker Lind, the so-called American Taliban, that Northern California kid who took a wrong turn in Afghanistan. He was prosecuted for treason. He ended up pleading guilty to a lesser crime. Um, think about Jose Padilla, who was originally held without charge by the military, U.S. citizen arrested in Chicago, but has now been charged under the criminal law and against whom criminal proceedings are occurring. And think of Richard Reed, the infamous shoe bomber, who also was prosecuted under our criminal laws. Those are really the only cases I could think of. They are really the exceptions. And following the 9-11 attacks, Congress expressly authorized the president, quote, to use all necessary and appropriate force against individuals that he determines had a part in the attacks on 9-11. Since that authorization, the authorization for the use of force, our military has detained without charge hundreds of asserted so-called enemy combatants. Most of these people were and are detained in the U.S. naval base in Guantanamo Bay, but there are a few in military prisons in the continental United States. Among the major constitutional questions of our time is what role, if any, U.S. courts should play with respect to these cases. Now, any case, as I've suggested, that involves the judiciary and military detention presents difficult questions for which our constitutional history provides very few answers. Even when the war is a conventional one, and even when those detained are formally enemy soldiers or nationals, Ex parte Quirin, in which the Supreme Court affirmed the military convictions of eight Nazi soldiers who infiltrated the United States. In that case, Justice Jackson, who was newly on the court, circulated an unpublished opinion for his colleagues in which he reminded them, quote, that the field they are, en they are entering is as novel to experienced judges as to new ones. Now, the Supreme Court in Quirin did uphold 
the detention, trial, conviction, and execution of the eight German soldiers. It was a difficult case, but in hindsight, it seems so easy. Everyone knew that World War II was going to end. The defendants were soldiers of an enemy state, a state with which we were formerly at war. They took off their uniforms only after they had landed on the beach at Amagansett, Long Island. They were charged with and convicted of specific war crimes. The present circumstances add several layers of complexity and perplexity to the issues that the court confronted in Quirin. We are detaining indefinitely, without charge, citizens of nations with whom we are at peace, often apprehended far from anything that could meaningfully be called a war zone. So in what sense are these enemy combatants? In what sense is, for judicial purposes, is this the adjudication of the acts occurring during a war? Well, let's look at how our Supreme Court has addressed cases involving these detainees and what lies ahead. One of the first post 9-11 cases involved an American citizen named Yasser Hamdi. He was captured in Afghanistan. He was designated by the president an enemy combatant and he was transferred to a naval brig in Norfolk, Virginia, where he was held without charge and incommunicado. His father filed a habeas corpus petition on his behalf. The Supreme Court issued a fractured decision comprising four separate opinions. And each one of the opinions issued by the court illustrates a different conception of the function our courts might perform during wartime and in the war on terror. Now at one end of the spectrum, Justice Thomas, writing for himself, viewed the case monochromatically. This is war, and as a result, the judiciary owes extreme, perhaps total deference to the political branches, especially the president. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum, Justice Scalia, in an opinion joined by Justice Stevens, looked to the criminal law paradigm. Justice Scalia wrote that it was the president's choice either to charge Hamdi with a crime or let him go. Justice Souter, writing for himself and Justice Ginsburg, focused on the separation of powers. In his view, the principal defect with the detention of Yasser Hamdi was that, in his opinion, Congress had not authorized it. He looked at the authorization for the use of military force that I quoted you and said, it says nothing about detention. Congress did pass a law after the Korematsu matter, after World War II, prohibiting the detention of US citizens in war and therefore, in his opinion, the president had simply exceeded his powers under the Constitution. Now, the plurality opinion, the opinion that controlled the outcome, was written by Justice O'Connor, Chautauqua's own Justice O'Connor. And her opinion governed the result. Writing for four justices, she held, she thought that the authorization for the use of military force generously could be read as authorizing the detention of Hamdi, who after all was captured with Taliban forces in Afghanistan. But she held that he could be detained only if the government provided him adequate procedural protections to ensure that he and others like him really were enemy combatants. Her opinion adopted a balancing test to flesh out the nature of the required protections, which it said included access to a neutral decision maker, a meaningful opportunity to rebut the military's charges, and at least in Hamdi's case, the right to a lawyer. So the four opinions in Hamdi really reflect a Supreme Court at the outset of what has been and is likely to continue to be a difficult search for the appropriate role to play. 
The range of opinions certainly reflects considerable uncertainty. And yet many read Justice O'Connor's plurality statement that, quote, war is not a blank check for the president regarding detention as an important, even if limited, statement by the court about civil liberties in war. And as well, the fact that every justice except Justice Thomas rejected the president's position led others to view the Hamdi decision as underscoring the Supreme Court's role with respect to the separation of powers, spurring the executive to reconsider its uncompromising position and hopefully spurring Congress to bestir itself as a coordinate branch. Now, what really stirred Congress was a case that the Supreme Court decided on the same day as Hamdi, a case called Rasul versus Bush. Unlike Hamdi, Rasul was not a citizen, and he was not held in the naval brig in Norfolk. He was held in Guantanamo outside U.S. borders. The president argued in the Supreme Court that U.S. courts had no authority over Guantanamo, and so they had no jurisdiction to consider habeas corpus petitions filed by Guantanamo detainees. The Supreme Court rejected that view six to three. That decision provoked Congress, which before that time had never so much as held a hearing about Guantanamo or the detention of enemy combatants. And what has ensued in the four years since Hamdi and Rasul was decided has been quite an interesting dialectic among our three branches of government, all in search of the right balance of authority. Now, when I say that Rasul provoked Congress to act, you might think that in light of Hamdi and Rasul, and the perplexity that we all feel as citizens that for years people were detained incommunicado and without charge, that Congress finally would have held hearings about who we were detaining and why and what procedures, if any, ought to apply with respect to their detention. But that isn't at all what happened. Rather, Congress simply amended the habeas corpus statute to strip federal courts of jurisdiction over petitions filed from Guantanamo. Now, that put the ball back in the court's court, so to speak. The following year, in a case called Hamdan, the Supreme Court held that Congress's attempted repeal of jurisdiction over Guantanamo cases was ineffective with respect to cases that had been filed before Congress acted, which is to say all cases. The Supreme Court then went on to consider the merits of Mr. Hamdan's appeal, and it again rebuked the president. It held that the military commissions that had been established for purposes of actually trying that handful of detainees who actually had been charged with war crimes was unlawful because the Supreme Court said it utilized procedures that Congress had not authorized. Okay? That decision by the Supreme Court in turn provoked Congress, which enacted yet another law. This is sort of a, sort of a constitutional ping pong here in which the president is sort of the ball, although a pretty pro, a ball with its own mind, for sure. Um, the, the Supreme Court's decision in Hamdan provoked Congress to enact something called the Military Commissions Act, which, again, attempted to strip the federal courts of jurisdiction, this time not just over future cases and not just over cases that would be filed from Guantanamo, but with respect to any foreign citizen held as a purported enemy combatant, even if he is held in the continental United States and even if he already has a petition for habeas corpus pending. So that took care of that. You can probably guess what the next step in this ping pong match is. 
Several Guantanamo detainees, including six that I represent, challenged that law as unconstitutional. And 10 days ago, on the very last day of the Supreme Court term, the Supreme Court announced that it was going to hear this case in the fall, and that it is unquestionably the most significant matter that the Supreme Court has accepted for review next term. Now, the facts of the, our petition are pretty simply stated and pretty stark. In late 2001, six Bosnian citizens were arrested in their homes with their, where they were living with their wives and children by Bosnian authorities at the request of the United States. They were held in a Bosnian prison while prosecutors investigated the United States' allegations of terrorism. After three months' investigation, the prosecutor reported to the Bosnian Supreme Court that he had not uncovered evidence of terrorism activity, and the Bosnian Supreme Court ordered their immediate release for lack of evidence. Something called the Human Rights Chamber of Bosnia, which is a tribunal that we created under the Dayton Peace Accords, ordered that these six prisoners not be removed from Bosnia. But literally, as they were being released from custody on the Bosnian Supreme Court's order, Bosnian authorities again swept them into custody on their way home and handed them over to U.S. forces who hooded them, handcuffed them, and flew them directly to Guantanamo, where they have remained for over five years. The United States has not filed a single charge against any one of these Bosnian citizens. Now, remarkably, after all this time, we are still fighting principally over whether federal courts, any federal court, can even accept a habeas corpus petition filed by one of these prisoners. The main question that the Supreme Court is going to address in the fall is whether when Congress enacted the Military Commissions Act and repealed that jurisdiction, even as to pre-existing cases, it violated a clause of our Constitution known as the Suspension Clause. The Suspension Clause provides that, quote, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety shall require it. Now, the government in this case is not arguing that anyone is rebelling or invading the United States. It contends that the suspension clause of the Constitution only protects the writ of habeas corpus filed by prisoners within the United States borders. Our view is that that was not a limitation of the writ of habeas corpus at common law at the time the Constitution was adopted. And we're also arguing that when the Supreme Court decided the Rasul case, it had already held that for all intents and purposes, the U.S. naval base in Guantanamo is United States territory and is subject to the sovereign authority of the United States. Now, in the case that the Supreme Court is going to hear, the government also argues, in any event, that even if it has acted to suspend the writ of habeas corpus, it has provided an adequate substitute. And under the procedure that Congress has provided, the, all detainees are required to be subjected to something called a combatant status review tribunal conducted by military officers in Guantanamo, which is then reviewed by the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Now, these combatant status review tribunals, or CSRTs, as they're called by those in the trade, are not like courts, even military courts. The, deta the detainees in these proceedings are not represented by lawyers. They are not permitted to see the government's classified evidence. They are not permitted to put forth any rebuttal evidence unless that evidence happens to be already at Guantanamo. 
One of our clients, for example, asked the CSRT to consider the decision of the Bosnian Human Rights Chamber in his case, but the tribunal refused to consider it on the ground that the decision was not, quote, reasonably available, even though it was not only published, but we had filed it in court and served it on the government's lawyers. Now, let me give you a flavor of these CSRT proceedings. This is the petition for writ of certiorari that I filed in the Supreme Court, and it includes the, government, the government's response to our petition was the transcript of the CSRT hearings. Here is the, the actual transcript of the hearing in Guantanamo over one of the individuals that I'm representing. I'll just tell you that when I say recorder, the recorder is the military lawyer that's presenting the charges, and the tribunal president is the presiding military officer. So here's the transcript. Recorder, He's ch the charge is, while living in Bosnia, the detainee associated with a known Al-Qaeda operative. Detainee, give me his name. Tribunal president, I do not know. Detainee, how can I respond to this? President, did you know of anybody that was a member of Al-Qaeda? Detainee, no, no. Tribunal President, I'm sorry, what was your response? No. President, no. Detainee, no. This is something the interrogators told me a long while ago. I asked the interrogators to tell me who this person was. Then I could tell you if I might have known this person, but, if not, the, but not if the person is a terrorist. Maybe I knew this person as a friend. Maybe it was a person that worked with me. Maybe it was a person that was on my team. But I don't know if this person is Bosnian, Indian, or whatever. If you tell me the name, then I can respond and defend myself against this accusation. Tribunal President, we are asking you the questions, and we need you to respond what is in the summary. Recorder, the detainee was arrested because of his involvement with a plan to attack the U.S. Embassy located in Sarajevo. Detainee, the answer is the same as before. The only thing I can tell you is I didn't plan or even think of that. Did you find any explosives with me, any weapons? Did you find me in front of the embassy? Did you find me in contact with the Americans? Did I threaten anyone? I am prepared now to tell you that if you have anything or any evidence, even if it is just very little, that proves that I went to the embassy and looked like that, and the transcript says detainee made a gesture with his head and neck as if he were looking into a building or a window, then I am ready to be punished. I can just tell you that I did not plan anything. Point by point, when we get to the point that I am associated with Al-Qaeda, but we already did that one. If it is the same point, I don't want to repeat myself. These accusations, my answer to all of them is I did not do these things. But I don't have anything to prove this. The only thing I have is my citizenship. I can tell you where I was. I have the papers to prove where I was. But to tell me I planned to bomb, I can only tell you I didn't plan it. President, does that conclude your statement? Detainee, this is it. But I was hoping you had evidence you could give me. If I was in your place, and I apologize in advance for these words, but if a supervisor came to me and showed me accusations like this, I would take these accusations and I would hit him in the face with them. Sorry about that. And the transcript then says, everyone in the, on the tribunal laughs. Tribunal president, we had to laugh, but it's okay. Detainee, why? because these are accusations that I can't even answer. I'm not able to answer them. You tell me I am from Al-Qaeda, but I am not an Al-Qaeda. I don't have any proof to give you except to ask you to catch bin Laden and ask him if I am a part of Al-Qaeda. <laughs> to tell me that I thought, I'll just tell you that I did not. I don't have any proof regarding this. What should be done is you should give me evidence regarding these accusations because I am not able to give you any evidence. I can just tell you no, and that is it. And that is the transcript. Now, however these petitions are resolved by the Supreme Court will, of course, provide us insight into how the court perceives its role in terrorism-related cases in our post-9-11 world. What's particularly novel about the pending case 
is that the is the tension that it presents between the court's two historic functions in wartime cases. Unlike past cases where upholding individual rights also had the effect of calibrating the relationship between Congress and the president, here there really is little question that Congress and the executive have acted together. Thus, the Supreme Court is going to have to choose whether to protect the individual right to judicial review when both political branches have tried to take it away. In considering that choice, our court, and indeed I think all branches of our government, might reflect more than perhaps we have to date on the experience of other democracies that have been themselves borne the frightening brunt of large-scale terrorism. Of course, our Constitution and our constitutional structure are unique, and the meaning of our suspension clause is not readily informed by the struggle of other countries against terrorism. But on broad issues of institutional integrity and the off-sighted off trade-off between individual liberties and national security, there really are other examples we can look to Sure, certainly there is no clearer example, no more reassuring beacon than the experience that the courts of Israel have had in dealing with terrorism in that country. The courts of Israel have extended to terrorism suspects hearing rights and detention rights that go far, far beyond the modest outlines even presented by Justice O'Connor in Hamdi. Rather than adopting a posture of extreme deference, Israeli courts have taken a leading role in articulating the standards for terrorism-related detention and interrogation, despite the fact that Israel lacks a written constitution and, because it's a parliamentary democracy, does not have a government of formally separated powers. Even with respect to the West Bank, for example, which is probably our closest Guantanamo or foreign analogy, outside the country's formal borders, a terrorism suspect in Israel cannot be denied counsel for more than four days without a judicial determination of necessity. And he must be provided a judicial hearing within eight days of the detention, in which the government is required to demonstrate the necessity for the continued detention. When the Second Intifada arose and the Israeli military went into the West Bank and was detaining up to 8,000 suspects, the military proposed an easing of these rules in light of the exigencies of the Intifada. They went to the court and said, look, within four days, we can't even figure out who these people are, let alone what evidence we have. The Supreme Court of Israel rejected a proposed 10-day 10 10 day extension of the period before a terrorism suspect has to be brought in front of a civilian judge. The Supreme Court declared that, quote, fundamental human rights require prompt review of detention by a judicial authority independent of the executive. And it rebuffed arguments that mirrored those made by the United States government in Hamdi. So in terrorism cases, the judicial role in Israel has evolved. They've had more, a longer experience than we've had. And they have gone from a sort of cautious deference by the courts with respect to claims of military imperative to an increasing degree of confidence. And our own courts might wish to consider this engaged and rights protective approach as a reminder that the risk of terrorism does not disqualify our judiciary from exercising its core functions, even when our executive thoroughly justifiably invokes the imperative of national security. The um, High Court of Israel issued a ruling a few years ago, this, this particular one, 
struck down the use of certain interrogation techniques that the security services were using, shaking and subjecting the t detainee to loud noises. And I'm going to just quote from you the concluding paragraph of the Israeli Supreme Court's decision because it bears on today's topic. Although the court acknowledged, quote, the difficult reality in which Israel finds herself security-wise, quote, this is the destiny of a democracy, as not all means are acceptable to it and not all practices employed by its enemies are open before it. Although a democracy must often fight with one hand tied behind its back, it nonetheless has the upper hand. Preserving the rule of law and recognition of an individual's liberty constitutes an important component in its understanding of security. At the end of the day, they add to its strength and allow it to overcome its difficulties. Thank you very much. The Jackson Center is a historical and educational facility dedicated to preserving the legacy of this country lawyer who became Solicitor General, Attorney General, a Justice of the Supreme Court, and served as Chief Prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials of Nazi war criminals following World War II. To learn more about this program, Robert Jackson, the Jackson Center, and upcoming events, the Jackson Center is located at 305 East 4th Street, Jamestown, New York, and found on the web at www.roberthjackson.org or contacted by telephoning 716-483-6646.